Germans, there's a well-trod story of World War I. We know about the soldiers, the Tommies. We know about the politicians who sent our boys off to fight. But I think there's an untold story of the munitions workers, both male and female, who came from all over the world to this tiny little place um, on the border of Scotland and England to help win the war, really. I started reading the pile of about 80 letters. We had a copy of the Moss Band magazine, a couple of copies, and that was one of the first things I found. I um, saw an advert, and it wasn't even an advert, it was a little bit in the Cumberland News, in, uh, on the, it comes out on a Friday, just looking for researchers, and I thought I could do that. We're almost at a thousand employees of the 30,000 that actually worked at um, HM Factory Gretna. We're trying to put some flesh on the bones of, of these unsung heroes. In many ways, it's, it's really what happened before and what happened after Gretna, as much as what they actually did in that very short period of time. I think it's just an incredible human story, a microcosm of all the change and evolution that was going on in our society. I mean, the 10,000 Irish navvies, these were itinerant workers. These are kind of ordinary people, you know, they're unsung heroes of this incredible project to build the largest munitions factory in the world in, in 15 months. And they arrived and they did what they had to do and then they all dispersed at the end of the war. Factory, HM Factory Gretna was built in 1915 as a response to the shell crisis. Lord Kitchener publicly said that the men at the front did not have as much ammunition as they needed. So HM Factory Gretna was built to make cordite, which is a non-propellant explosive that's put into shells that are then shipped off to the front. The person that sticks in my mind is Kenneth Bingham Quinnan. He was the mastermind behind this huge factory. He came from South Africa. He had such a, a great reputation that when the First World War broke out, uh, the British government asked him to come over. He was probably the only person who had the imagination and, and mind to, to devise a factory nine miles long, hundreds of different buildings, all the processes from start to finish, from the raw products right to the, to the finished article. It needed a, a man of genius. They called for people from all over the British Empire to come and staff and manage it. And then the women came along, there was about 12,000 women. Chemists would have been able to do a little by themselves, but without the munitions worker, the huge production of cordite would not have been possible. Women had to step up and do these tasks. Finding out what they actually did in their roles here is very, very difficult, but it's that wider picture of that wider family. I mean, we have just recently had a photograph brought in, walking off the street, but the photograph, which is of a group of, of, of men, and on the back, gold dust, is not only all their names, but their jobs, some of whom are, are almost indecipherable. I was asked to, uh, to look at um, Agnes Cowan, and she was an assistant medical officer at Gretna for 12 months. She was one of the sort of first cohorts of women to train as a doctor at the University of Edinburgh. She she went on to become a, a missionary in Manchuria and, and, um, and she worked there in the hospitals there for 25 years. My grandfather was a manufacturing chemist. My mother's recollection is that he was in charge of the mixing of the cordite. 
mixing the devil's porridge. He recommended showers for all explosive workers before going off shift. A lot of the women complained about that. They were afraid they would be spied upon by the men, and some of them felt it wasn't natural to wash all over every day. He recommended all explosive workers to be checked before starting to ensure that there was no metal on them. And he re recommended that all workers mixing chemicals wear a mask covering their face and nose. It was a nasty place. Whiffs of acid would keep coming over every now and again and used to fairly take your breath away. My gums were all poisoned with the acid and I had to have all my teeth taken out. always known that um, our great grandfather, James Charles Meldon, had been an innovative electrical engineer. We looked at the jewellery and um, artefacts that had come down to us through our mum. And the gold watch that we had seen there before, we began to look at more uh, closely. We saw the inscriptions and uh, became aware of such a thing as the HM Gretna Works. The photograph behind me on the wall was taken by his father in 1885 when he was a boy of 14, 13, 14. Even like, to consider that he became an electrical engineer in the 1880s is quite exciting for me. I'm the, the great grandson of Maud Nunn, nay uh, Bruce, who works at, uh, at Gretna and who was awarded uh, an OBE for her acts of bravery in, in, in dealing with the fire that broke out. Amongst the things that, that she did were, was to sort of climb up and cut down a lot of the, uh, of the burning cotton material to, to stop the fire from spreading. And she saved a lot of people's lives. She did return to this work. They were attending a reunion of the women who worked in the Aiklet munitions factory during the Second World War. Maud Nunn, at 95, was the oldest one there. She'd worked at a munitions factory in Gretna in the First World War, been awarded the OBE for putting out a fire, and then come back for more at Aiklet, where she ended up in hospital for six months after an explosion. The bullets went off into my fears. I was looking at them, and when they come to the, at the end of the table, and as I put one down, one went up, and I just crossed my arms as I might have been blind. And, and you were in hospital for a long time it, after that? About five months and a half, to be exactly. Drawing attention to the, the contribution that women made is an incredibly important thing to do. And, and you know, other other events in her life, uh, you know, um, her husband, her husband um, took his own life and she came through it all. She was one of thousands, but she played an incredibly important role in both world wars and is a really great example of a working class woman who really pushed the boundaries of what was expected of her and lived an incredibly long life that saw the advent of women getting the vote, to the pill being developed. It's very interesting to sort of chart and place Maud's life in context and that kind of rich family uh, remembrances just add to that. She, she was an unperturbable person that just really took everything in a stride. When we get lucky and we get a, a gentleman, a chemist, you know, from Australia, who we go on to discover was the um, originator of Vegemite, then clearly suddenly whole doors of information open to you. Thomas and Nora, I love them. I just want to meet Thomas and, or I want to give Nora a hug. You feel very privileged um, to be peeping into these lives. My grandfather we knew had been involved in World War I and we knew that he'd been at the Battle of the Somme where he'd been involved in experimenting with mustard gas. My 
parents' generation passed away recently and we found these uh, various bits and pieces, including this with a silver cigarette case that simply had his initials and the word Gretna and a date on it. My understanding is that he was involved in developing ways of recovering alcohol from the manufacturing process of producing the cordite. All of my life, I knew him as an entomologist, not as a, a soldier. It was not something he spoke about in all of his um, lifetime that I knew. But he was interested in the mites that live on other insects. So <laughs> if you can imagine, he spent most of his life staring down a microscope. <laughs> Then you have other pieces of kind of uh, primary source documentation like letters or diary entries or memoirs um, that just bring them all to life and make them seem like real people. My great uncle was William Gidley Emmett, who worked here. For me, he was great uncle. He was Uncle Bill. I wasn't necessarily greatly aware of um, what he'd done, or indeed the scale of what took place, you know, here at Gretna. He was a scientist, a chemist, then had a three-year contract out in Japan with the Japan Explosive Company. It was like a small colony, you know, it was both work and play. He, he also um, climbed many of the mountains in Japan. He spent five years working for Shell. He was a manager of a refinery at Suez. He met my aunt in 1937. Uh, they were walking in the Alps and uh, she was taking a zigzag path up a mountain and he was taking the direct route. So they kept bumping into each other. His wife was German. He had never told her what he did. I think one of the ones that was interesting was a Miss Muir. She was the only female of the danger buildings staff. She actually travelled across to New York at one time, but only stayed for two years, um, and her role on the ship's passenger list was stenographer. She joined the RAF, and I think she came back to the UK through ill health, because she died two years later, or 18 months later, in Moffat, which was a spa town. I've had a couple of instances of a couple who met and married here. So here we are in the centre of Gretna that was built for the workers of HM Factory Gretna. And the building behind me is the old Gretna Institute and I believe that that's likely to be one of the places my grandmother Jane Jackson worked as a shorthand typist when she was employed at the factory. My grandparents, their first married home was one of the early wooden bungalows that were built for the workers at the factory. So for our family, it's always been a very close connection. I've lived here for 43 years and I didn't know why, specifically, Gretna was here. I'd never heard the term munitionette used before. And it is habited chiefly by pretty young girls, looking as if they were practicing a neat domestic craft rather than a deadly domestic process. Rebecca West, 1917. Mary McCulloch and John Stanley Wise. Oh, we've got a wedding photo of them. He was a cad. John Stanley Wise died in New York City, but we discovered why he died there, because he ditched his first wife, and his second wife died in America, and then he married um, the daughter of a baronet. A lot of the other research has just come up because something's caught my eye. I've mostly been focusing on women's football. It has turned up all sorts of wonderful things, it really has, you know. They had control boards for everything. They had liquor control boards, they had the cakes and pastries orders of 1917, which meant you weren't allowed to decorate cakes and biscuits. One of the bakers in Dumfries was had up in front of the sheriff, put desiccated coconut on top of a Madeira cake. I'd done research into a, a lady um, who worked in the factory and uh, 
she lost part of her arm in an accident. It was a, it was a picture of her presenting a bouquet of flowers to the Queen. And then talking to somebody one day and said, oh, I know her son, and I can remember going round to his house and watching his mum peeling potatoes with one hand. She had to put the hell of it in her arm and, and peeled it with one hand. And, he remember, and stories like that, are, they're fantastic, you know. And uh, if you don't record them, don't write them down, they're lost. They're lost, yeah. The article about the King and Queen's visit to HM Factory Gretna in 1917 threw up loads of facts and figures because they toured around the entire factory. The canteen provided 14,000 meals a day. The laundry laundered 6,000 articles of laundry every day. One of the, the very nice stories was that one of the aides got separated from the royal party. One of the slightly overzealous policewomen at the factory had asked him, so where's your pass? The woman is now manhandling him, telling him, you can't be in here. Intervention of the Queen was the only thing that saved him. I've had lots of advertisement, job advertisements, lady policewomen. I couldn't believe the range of newspapers that carried these advertisements. There was, I think, 167 police women at the height in uh, Gretna. We're standing today outside a, a building which was the police headquarters for the factory. My person of interest at the moment is Ethel Jeeps. She was a policewoman at the Devil's Porridge here. She was one of the first in the country. When I've read into her, her main subject and her main interest was in the welfare of females, of young girls. And that seemed to follow her right throughout her police career. She moved to Bolton after Gretna and she was one of four policewomen, the first four in Bolton. I have a theory that uh, she was possibly involved in the suffragettes as uh, the 1911 census suffragettes boycotted and uh, I can't find her anywhere in 1911 on the census. But in Gretna uh, it was trying to keep the men away from the females and the females away from the men, I think, was, was the main task. They liked to keep them separate. She was promoted to a sergeant. She had a very long police career, a very long started here at Gretna. I would say they were, you know, came from families that were well, well to do, you know, sensible, mature ladies that, uh, knew the difference between right and wrong. They seem to be more of people, people's morals than anything else. They used to vet the films in the cinema and they used to check who was sitting in the back row of the cinema. They censored the films. See, they were fit to show the workers, you know, it wasn't too uh, raunchy or whatever. They also placed the trains and there was female only trains and female only carriages. They also had, were given jurisdiction, to say, in Carlisle and in Dumfries to assist the local police force. Um, because when the workers had a day off and they had money in their pocket, they went drinking. Lloyd George, I think it was, who said that uh, drink was causing more problems than all the German submarines put together. So they uh, introduced this thing called the Carlisle Experiment. They built the best of facilities at Gretna and districts to try and contain the workers in their sites. These fields were set up by the Social and Athletics Committee for sort of multi-purpose. Uh, they had the hockey pitches, they had the cricket, they also had another area for football. In uh, August of 1918, there was the East Gala here. I had a painting of Mary Annie Anderson. There was the Moss Band Swifts and they played in uh, Carlisle, uh, June 1917. We had a lot of activities, like they had gymnastic classes and they had acting. One of the people I've identified from the Gretna girls was someone called Jessie Latimer. She was born in Annan in 1891. She did a lot of performance and singing events. But she was also in the team sheet for the 
the Gretna girls match at Carlisle. Ivy Herbert, she was the music teacher at Gretna, but she went on to be sort of like a composer herself. And I found her on a radio broadcast in India, and yet nobody knows who, who, basically who she is. You know, it's quite bizarre. Three of my Scottish relatives were involved in working at HM Gretna. Nana, she was Alice Bett, and Auntie Nellie were in their early 20s. They were housemaids. They had to ring a bell at 4am in the morning. They had to make porridge for 100 girls. After meal times, the plates were not only piled on the sides, they were piled high on the floor as well. They were both daughters of fishermen and they'd argued with the people in the hostel that having lived by the sea all their lives, they would see the tide come in because they'd been told that no one ever sees the tide come in at the Solway Firth. It comes in like a galloping horse. So they set off and there they were waiting when all of a sudden Alice said, look, and the tide was in and they'd missed it. I think they wanted to do something different with their lives. They wanted to stand up and be counted as the young, strong women that they were. Everybody was crucial. Absolutely everybody. It's a massive legacy, I think. We can at least make sure that the stories still exist, um, because otherwise they will disappear. Suddenly in our family we now have this new narrative. So I think it's important to keep as much as you possibly can alive um, for younger people to know what was here before. So today is Father's Day in Australia and this is my daughter. She's eight months old. An absolute joy to be with and partly in tribute to my great-grandmother we decided to call her Maud.